Welcome to Servants of the Lord Ministries. My name is Dr. Keith Jenkins. I'm the International Coordinator for Servants of the Lord Ministries. Before I start my message today, let me share with you the commission of the ministry that was given to Joseph Hedgecock many years ago. He said, I have children in every nation, and you have brothers and sisters whose hearts are crying out to me. They've sought me for ministry, blessings and gifts. He said, I've given them those things and it's blessed them. But there's a part of their spirit that it never fulfilled, that is reserved for an intimate relationship with me. Now their hearts are crying out to me just for me. That is who I'm sending you to because I don't want them to take the years it took you to get to me because there was no one to show you how at the time. Servants of the Lord Ministries is a teaching and training ministry sent to the body of Christ to reach people everywhere with a heart after God. This message is for those who want to get to know Him and grow up in Him. Today I'm going to be sharing a message on the narrow way. Jesus said in Matthew 7 verses 13 and 14, I'm reading. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. I'm starting verse 13. Enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in that way. Verse 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. The word straight in Strong's is number 4728. It comes from another word which means narrow, from obstacles standing close about. Noah Webster in 1828 defined the word straight as Number one, narrow, close, not broad. Number two, close, as in intimate, as a straight degree of favor. Number three, strict, rigorous. Number four, difficult or distressful. Number five, straight, not crooked. In the book, The Guilted Prison, Revised Edition, in the introduction on pages 4 and 5, Joseph Hedgecock writes, When Satan prevents you from walking through the straight gate and on the narrow way, you are already on the way to spiritual destruction. If he can separate you from fellowship with the Lord because you follow the broad way, he has succeeded in stealing spiritual life from you. If you can be imprisoned by lusts of the flesh or addiction, Satan will use those methods. If you will not yield to that type of imprisonment and are determined to walk with God, Satan will seduce you with ways that seem right. You may have no intention of being deceived. You do not yield to the lust of the flesh, nor are you consciously rebellious. Yet you know you are not growing spiritually as you should. You may be confused and frustrated because you seem to obey the rules, but your daily life proves you're not spiritual. The entrance to the narrow way is the straight gate. The broad gate says you can still be saved without making Jesus functional Lord of your life. Charles Finney would always insist on those seeking salvation to attend an after-inquiry meeting. This was an additional meeting. His messages lasted two to three hours in length and were designed to make people uncomfortable, resembling a lawyer's discourse more than a sermon. In the autobiography of Charles Finney on pages 159 to 161, we read from Charles' own journals. I always insisted much in my instructions upon entire consecration to God giving up all to him, body, soul, possessions, to be forever after used for his glory as a condition of acceptance with God. Sinners were not encouraged to expect the Holy Spirit to convert them while they were passive and never told to wait God's time, but were taught unequivocally that their first and immediate duty was to submit themselves to God, renounce their own will, their own way and themselves, and to instantly deliver up all that they were. 
and all that they had to their rightful owner, the Lord Jesus Christ. They were taught that the only obstacle in their way was their own stubborn will, that God was trying to gain their unqualified consent to give up their sins, accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their righteousness and salvation. The point was frequently urged upon them to give their consent that they were told that the only difficulty was to get their own honest and earnest consent to the terms upon which Christ would save them and the lowest terms upon which they could possibly be saved. The narrow way is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You must consent to his terms for your salvation and understand that your righteousness is dependent on making him Lord and following Christ as a disciple. The broad way is the alternative gospel that says you can call Jesus Lord and still do what you want. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. The kingdom of God now has everything you need by faith on the narrow way. Jesus explained it like this in John's Gospel, chapter 15. I'm reading verses 1 to 8. This is John's Gospel, chapter 15. I'm starting in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Verse 2. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. And he that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Verse 6. If a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Verse 7. And if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Those ashamed of Jesus' teaching are comfortable, and do not even check to make sure that they have the fruit that they are following Jesus. By using their own minds, they find it impossible to understand the things of God and make excuses. Jesus is Lord, and you have an opportunity to learn, repent, and get ready, because the kingdom of God is here now by the Spirit. But this requires some discomfort. Jesus said in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 23 to 26, I'm reading. This is Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 23. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Verse 24. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Verse 25. For what is man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be a castaway? Verse 26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory, and in his Father's, and of the holy angels. Only the narrow way leads to life, because it's free from the corruption in this world that leads to destruction and death. Jesus explained in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, I'm reading verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Verse 25. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Verse 26. And every one that hears these sayings of mine and does them not 
shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Verse 27. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Only those following Jesus are kept safe. John was a disciple, and he said in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. This is 1 John chapter 5. I'm reading verse 19. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. Those blind to the corruption in this world are earthly minded, listen to conspiracy theories, and do not realize they are lost. This includes those born again not following Jesus. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 11, I'm reading. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Verse 4. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, shall shine unto them. Verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants, for Jesus' sake. Verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed, and are perplexed, but do not despair. Verse 9. Persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Verse 10. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Verse 11. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. The only solution for sin and the corruption in this world is the literal functional lordship of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. Even those confessing their sins will not be saved, but only those who repent of their own lordship and let him provide the solution he wants. James said in James chapter 4 and verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The gospel does not attract those who are comfortable now. Jesus said in Luke 6, I'm reading verses 20 to 25. This is Luke's gospel, chapter 6, starting in verse 20. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye, poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Verse 21. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Verse 22. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Verse 23. Rejoice ye in the day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Verse 24. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Verse 25. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. And woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. The kingdom of God is for those who do not want to compromise and those who do not want to serve money. Joseph Hedgecock, the author of the book, My Sheep, Him, My Voice, would say, if God delivered you into something, he would deliver you out. You will also overcome this world if you are on the narrow way. John said in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Whatever originates from God overcomes the world, 
But you have to believe this by faith and obey. By hearing his voice and doing his perfect will, everyone can now escape the corruption that's in this world and not sin. Joseph Hedgecott says in chapter 9 of the book, My Sheep Hear My Voice, on page 109, There is a very comfortable Christianity most believers are following, but the end of that way is death. Jesus himself warned us that very few find the straight gate and narrow way which leads to life. It is one thing to be openly rebellious. At least you know you are wrong and there is hope you will turn from your wickedness. However, those believers who are deceived think they are right when they are actually in sin. They are following the broad way that seems right to them. But the end of that road is death. They don't see the sin in what they are doing. They won't listen to warnings because they are convinced they are going the right direction. If you try to warn someone who is deceived, they become offended and typically respond, Who do you think you are to warn me? I am not wrong. There are thousands of believers who think like I do, so how can I be wrong? How many people believe what you believe? Very few find the entrance to the narrow way because they are looking for a way to serve God and money. They even justify serving their own needs first based on what others are doing. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 to 32. I'm reading Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, starting in verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, and what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are ye not much better than they? Verse 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Verse 28. And why take ye thought for clothes? Consider the lilies of the field, and how they grow, and they toil not, neither do they spin. Verse 29. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you, of little faith? Verse 31. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? Verse 32. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Those on the narrow way do not think about the things they need in this world. Keep your mind on what God tells you to think about, or otherwise the God of this world will contaminate you all over again. Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, I'm reading. This is Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Verse 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Verse 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Verse 6, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Verse 7, In the which ye also walked some time when you lived in them. Verse 8, But now you also put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. 
Verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. The new man does not seek knowledge. If you can get to the root of sin now and dig it out, then God will show you the next thing you need to know. If you need to know anything else, he can direct you personally through the process of conviction as you're reading the written word. This way, every scripture that brings conviction will be received as a lifeline for someone seeking to obey, not just biblical knowledge. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. In the Amplified Bible, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 34 says, Awake from your drunken stupor and return to sober sense and your right minds and sin no more. For some of you have not the knowledge of God. You are utterly and willfully and disgracefully ignorant and continue to be so, lacking the sense of God's presence and all true knowledge of Him. I say this to your shame. Many do not want to endure the process of being pruned to have the true knowledge of God. The knowledge of God you need now is how to stop sinning. The drunken stupor comes from an excess of knowledge making someone look like an adult, but still sin like a babe in Christ. Paul said in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Those who are spiritual do not rely on their knowledge of the written word or methods, to help someone trapped in the sin. Those hearing God restore a person to a spirit of meekness so that they can repent and get to the root of sin themselves. Those repenting need truth to recognize they opened the door to the enemy and committed spiritual adultery because they were not willing to put their carnal nature in the grave and took pity on their flesh instead. Paul said in Hebrews chapter 12 verses 14 to 17 we read this is Hebrews chapter 12 I'm reading verse 14 follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord verse 15 looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled Verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Verse 17, for you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Those who have not put on Christ have peace, not seeking the things of this world. And when convicted through the Holy Spirit, come to repentance and stay on the narrow way. Those who are carnal do not repent because they are still using their own minds trying to understand the things of God and the lack of repentance ends in tears. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21 to 24, I'm reading. This is Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 21. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, and true holiness. There is nothing good in the flesh, and you must rely completely on the Holy Spirit to find truth and stay on the narrow way until the end. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were sealed unto the day of redemption. 
You will be ready for the day of redemption if you listen and respond to the grieving of the Holy Spirit. If you continue to grieve him all the time, your name will be blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. This is Revelation chapter 3, I'm reading verse 5. He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Verse 6. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Everyone who is not on the narrow way that leads to life will have his name blotted out because you have not chosen life. By overcoming sin and the devil on the narrow way, trust in God. Paul said in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. This is Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is an article from Christianity Today. After his conversion, Charles Finney, the American evangelist, prepared for ministry in the Presbyterian Church and was ordained in 1824, hired by the Female Missionary Society of the Western District. He began his missionary labors in the frontier communities of Upper New York. A rigid Calvinism dominated the theological landscape, but Finney urged his listeners to accept Christ openly and publicly. His style differed too. His messages were more like a lawyer's argument than a pastor's sermon. At Evans Mills, he was troubled that the congregation continually said they were pleased with his sermons. He set about to make his message less pleasing and more productive. At the end of his sermon, which stressed the need for conversion, he took a bold step. You who have made up your minds to become Christians and will give your pledge to make your peace with God immediately should rise up. The entire congregation, having never heard such a challenge, remained in their seats. You have taken your stand, Finney said. You have rejected Christ and his gospel. The congregation was dismissed and many left angry. If you continue using your mind, you are rejecting God's grace and the gift of eternal life. That includes the ability to hear and obey God. You are just like those people getting angry with Charles Finney in New York who would not stand up. They were not resisting man, but God putting themselves back in the clutches of the devil. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, I'm reading Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, In whom you also trusted after that you'd heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. The day of redemption is either when you die or when he appears. On that day, you need to be in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the person who reveals sin daily and is there to help you work out your salvation and repent at the root. He is divine nature living in you by grace. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. If you cannot obey the Spirit of Christ now, then how will you obey Christ and be part of Jesus' government when he appears? Many have been taught that they're already righteous by just saying a prayer at salvation. Those who want to be Lord of their own lives accept false teaching. The only way a child of God ever ends up in hell is if they continue to deceive themselves. God is faithful to make sure you wake up to righteousness before it's too late by letting you reap what you sow. Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. This is Galatians chapter 6, I'm reading verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 8. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. 
If you do not like what you are reaping, then change your sowing. Those on the narrow way trust God and overcome evil. We read in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 7. I'm reading Proverbs chapter 3, starting in verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. Verse 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Verse 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. The straight gate and the narrow way has boundaries, and the Holy Spirit is faithful to warn you before you get off the narrow way and start desiring something in this world you don't really need. David said in the Psalms, this is Psalm 23, verses 1, and I'm reading to verse 6. This is Psalm 23, starting in verse 1. A Psalm of David, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Verse 5. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David's salvation was based on Jesus being his shepherd. He was seeking God's righteous paths and did not want anything for himself. He will provide for you on the narrow way. We read in the book of Isaiah 55, verses 1 to 13. This is Isaiah 55. I'm starting in verse 1. Lo, everyone that's thirsty, come to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Verse 2. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Verse 3. Incline your ear, and come unto me, hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Verse 4. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Verse 5. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not. These shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified thee. Verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he shall have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Verse 10. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and returns not again, but waters the earth, and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. Verse 11. So shall my word be, that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing with where I sent it. Verse 12. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace, and the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Verse 13. Instead of thorns shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord, for a name, for an everlasting sign, that thou shalt not be cut off. Not all sin is obvious. So you must listen to the Holy Spirit. We read in Proverbs 14 and verse 12 and 13. This is Proverbs chapter 14. I'm reading verse 12. 
There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Verse 13. Even in laughter the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. On the narrow way, Jesus is your teacher, and he is gentle with you because you are coming to repentance and growing spiritually. Jesus said in Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. I'm reading Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, starting in verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Verse 30. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Never question God's decisions. He has the plan and knows what is about to happen. Only he is qualified to make every decision. We read in the book of Isaiah, chapter 46, verses 9 to 12. This is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 46, starting in verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Verse 11. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, and I will also bring it to pass, and I have purposed it, and I will also do it. Verse 12. Hearken unto me, you stout-hearted that are far from righteousness. For more information on God Sees Things in Fullness, please refer to chapter 11, God Sees in Fullness. In the book, Wake Up, Time is Running Out, Volume 1, Foundations for Spiritual Maturity by Joseph Hedgecock. You can ask God any question and he will answer. How if you harden your heart to the Holy Spirit, it's because you want to do whatever you want instead. Those stout-hearted or stubborn people in the church are far away from God's paths of righteousness for their own lives. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 20, I'm reading. This is the book of Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their own mind, Verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. Christ stripped himself of his divinity and relied on God to fulfill his mission on earth in righteousness. The knowledge of God always includes what you need to do in the next four seconds. Concentrate on what you need to do now. And if there's anything you need to do in advance, God will tell you or remind you based on a previous experience by the Spirit. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 33 and 34, this is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. I'm reading verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Take one day at a time. Your priority should be his kingdom now and being free from sin, and he will put food on the table through prayer. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verses 9 to 13. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, and starting in verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Verse 12. 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. You will need to make sure you escape the traps of the evil one in this dark world, as otherwise it will be harder the next day to serve Christ. The devil uses ways that seem right, and if you are still using your mind, you will fall into the trap he is setting for you. In the book, The Guilty Prison, revised edition, at the end of chapter 11, on how do you escape, on page 99, Joseph Hedgecott writes, Walking in the Spirit neutralizes Satan's traps and delivers you from the prisons of your flesh. Only those consistently walking in the Spirit will be overcomers. You grow spiritually by hearing and obeying the Holy Spirit with different levels of pressure. The flesh will always be uncomfortable and nervous on the narrow way, especially at the beginning. If you don't like listening to the flesh complaining, then kill the flesh. If you don't kill it, then the devil will make you comfortable in this world and you can become enslaved again. Jesus said in John 10 and verse 10, this is John's Gospel, chapter 10, I'm reading verse 10. The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The devil can easily steal things by making you comfortable. He gives you what you want in this life that is temporal, so you ignore something eternal he is stealing to keep you a prisoner. The devil spends a fortune every year on keeping new baby Christians sleepy and comfortable as part of his war effort. Jesus said in Matthew 25, verses 1 to 5. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, starting in verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Verse 2. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Verse 3. They which were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Verse 4. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Verse 5. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. The word virgin in Strong's is number 3933. Of unknown origin, it means a maiden by implication, unmarried daughter. You should be getting ready for his appearing. If you are just born again like a young virgin in these last days, or still a baby Christian after many years, here is a checklist. Number one, get a wedding dress. You have to put on the operating system of Christ and put off the flesh. Number two, make Jesus the functional Lord of your life. Become a living sacrifice and seek his terms for your salvation. Number three, establish Jesus as your first love. To love anything else more than Jesus is idolatry. You will need to enter the kingdom of God now. If you're not abiding in Christ now, you will be left behind. John said in 1 John chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, I'm reading. This is 1 John chapter 2, I'm reading verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that does righteousness is born of him. Many believe that as long as you are born again, you are automatically righteous, and you'll be ready for his appearing. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 to 29 says, Number 1. If you are not abiding in Christ, you will be ashamed and left behind when he comes, even if you are born again. Number 2. Not everyone who is born again is righteous. However, those who are doing the right things consistently are definitely born again, but not the other way around. Carnal Christians feel safe because they have a good pastor and attend a lively church with the gifts of the Spirit operating. But the gifts of the Spirit are not the sign of maturity. If you are hearing truth, 
and your life is not changing, you are deceiving yourself. It'd be worse for you in the judgment. We read in John chapter 9, verses 39 to 41. This is John's Gospel, chapter 9, and reading first 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, and they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. Verse 40. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Verse 41. And Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. False doctrines taught by men have replaced the truth in many churches. You are responsible for saving yourselves. Peter said in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 40 to 41. This is Acts chapter 2, I'm reading verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. Peter did not baptize everyone who responded. He only baptized those who were rejoicing after hearing the news, the burying the flesh, and establishing Jesus' lordship was necessary for salvation. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. In the Amplified Bible, 2 Corinthians 7 and 10 says, for godly grief and the pain God is permitted to direct produce a repentance that leads and contributes to salvation and deliverance from evil. And it never brings regret, but worldly grief, the hopeless sorrow that is characteristic of the pagan world is deadly, breeding and ending in death. Worldly sorrow can only be avoided through repentance and the pain of godly sorrow from conviction that most do not want to endure. Jesus said in Matthew 15 and verse 9, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Your worship is in vain if your life is not changing. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Your confidence has to be in the fact that you are doing the will of God by the Spirit. Ministries are posting videos trying to compete among themselves, offering prosperity, miracle and blessing as enticements without true repentance. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, and verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The persecuted church on the narrow way have to meet underground or very early in the morning, and not always when it's convenient, during the day or on a weekend. Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 11 to 14. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. I'm starting in verse 11. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Verse 12. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine, and go into the mountains, and seek them that which is gone astray? Verse 13. And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety-nine which went not astray. Verse 14. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. To be saved, you first have to recognize that you are truly lost and see God's messengers and the promises of God as a lifeline for your soul. Charles Finney described his salvation experience like this. He then gave me many other promises, both from the Old and the New Testament, especially some most precious promises respecting our Lord Jesus Christ. 
I never can in words make any human being understand how precious and true these promises appeared to me. I took them one after the other as infallible truth and the assertions of God who could not lie. They did not seem so much to fall into my intellect as into my heart, to be put within the grasp of the voluntary powers of my mind. And I seized hold of them, appropriated them, and fastened upon them with the grasp of a drowning man. The gift of God is for you to stay on the narrow way. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. I'm reading Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Verse 9. Not of works, he any man should boast. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You should be his workmanship, doing the things he has ordained for your life. Any attempt to save yourself or return to the flesh or the comforts of the flesh is not trusting God. Christianity is not just another religion, it's a relationship with a living God. In the book, The Guilty Prison Revised Edition, at the end of chapter 13 on the blessings of freedom, on page 116, Joseph Hedgecock writes, When you go through the straight gate and walk on the narrow way, you live in the kingdom of God and enjoy communion with Jesus Christ and the Father. There is corruption everywhere. Asking God everything is part of the intimacy with Christ that ensures you are not contaminated again with this world. If you just ask God the big things, then you are still not trusting God with all your heart. We read in Luke 13, verses 23 to 24. This is Luke's Gospel. Chapter 13, I'm reading verse 23. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there a few that would be saved? And he said unto them, verse 24, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. To be saved, you have to enter in through the straight gate. The instruction to enter through the straight gate is urgent, because when you try to enter, you might not be able to abide because the corruption of the devil is still in you. You accepted those lies by making excuses for sin. God is not the problem. James said in James chapter 1, verses 13 to 17, I'm reading. This is James chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Let no man say, when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempt he any man. Verse 14, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Verse 15, then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. Verse 16, do not err, my beloved brethren. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Through the gospel of grace, you can now learn from your mistakes and abide. Climbing the hill of the Lord is part of the narrow way. David said in the Psalms 24 and verses 3 to 6. This is in the Psalms, chapter 24, I'm reading verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Verse 4. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, and who hath not lived up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Verse 5. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. Verse 6. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Selah. If someone has preached a gospel to you where you do not have to seek the Lord, and is excusing sin, reject it. At the moment, God is not treating us according to our sins, because no one will stand and have access to God otherwise through the Holy Spirit. 
We read in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. I'm reading Romans, chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Verse 4, and patience experience and experience hope. Verse 5, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. God is pure, and the devil cannot give anything to God that he does not already have. You should have a confidence that when you come to God, that he is not corrupt in any way. Jesus proved that he was not corrupt, dying on the cross for sinners, overcame the devil and this world, and rose again. John said in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1, This is 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1. Whosoever believes that Jesus the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also, that is begotten of him. In the Amplified Bible, 1 John 5 and verse 1 says, Every one who believes, adheres to, trusts in, and relies on the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, is born again, child of God. And everyone that loves the Father also loves the one born of him, his offspring. Messiah means anointed one. All authority and power belongs to Jesus. However, Jesus did not kick out the Romans or lock up the devil, but he provided the kingdom of God for you to live in now. He also gave you the gift of eternal life so that you can communicate with God and obey him. Even death could not hold Jesus because he never sinned. When the devil was not watching, all the sins of the world were put on Jesus so that mankind did not have to serve sin anymore. Everyone now has a choice to repent, confess, and be saved. Jesus is the King of Kings, but he was put under the angels to obtain eternal salvation for all those on the narrow way willing to suffer and die for the truth. Paul was speaking about Jesus in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 to 9. This is Hebrews chapter 5, I'm reading verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Verse 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Our salvation is based on obeying God like a little child. Knowledge apart from conviction has no value in the kingdom. God's ways are not like man's ways that need adjusting each month based on changing circumstances. In the kingdom of God, everyone is like a little child. God does not make mistakes. Jesus said in Matthew 18, verses 3 and 4. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. I'm reading verse 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as his little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus described the entrance to the straight gate and the narrow way. Are you still not convinced? Your life needs to rest on the power of God and the promises of God. You should be following him. Otherwise, you will not enter the kingdom of God and perish. Jesus was speaking to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. This is Matthew's gospel, chapter 16. I'm reading verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, 
Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Verse 18. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The devil does not have a strategy against those who hear from God and obey what they hear instantly. The devil needs you to procrastinate, so he has time to appeal to your fleshly desires. The devil keeps you ignorant of the truth and gets you to believe lies at the beginning that will hinder truth later when you try to overcome. If you are willing to humble yourself and get on the narrow way, you will quickly discover that the Lord is doing the right things out of love and wants everyone to have a chance to be saved. We read in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 9. I'm reading verses 23 and 24. This is Jeremiah, chapter 9, starting in verse 23. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Verse 24. But let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Some seek more power so they can overcome sin with no desire to killing the flesh because the devil has made them comfortable. The world believes that what you need is more power and strength. This belief has even crept into carnal believers as it appeals to their flesh. John said in 1 John 2, verses 14 to 17, I'm reading. This is 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 14. I've written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16. For all that is in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Verse 17. The world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. John was even writing to the ones who had been in ministry for a long time to stay on the narrow way and not trust in power and strength, but in doing what pleases God by obeying the Holy Spirit. James said in James chapter 1 and verse 4, But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Prosperity in God's workmanship comes through patience. Those on the narrow way no longer desire anything in this world. They see trials as a blessing to help them grow up spiritually. Anything that comes to the surface through pressure is a blessing and through repentance, will equate to eternal glory by grace. God is willing to give you spiritual wisdom if you will follow his instructions, keep his commandments, and make no excuses for the flesh. James continues in James chapter 1, verse 5, and reading to verse 11. This is James chapter 1, starting in verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Verse 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Verse 7. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Verse 9. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Verse 10. But the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. Verse 11. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat 
but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Those who are comfortable now in this world do not have the right foundation. No one gets out of God's school. You can only overcome trials using God's solutions to life's problems on the narrow way. We read in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 to 4. This is Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Verse 4. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You do not get the crown of life without some training. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 5, If any man also strive for masteries, he is not yet crowned, except he strive lawfully. The word lawfully in Strong's is number 3545. It's an adverb from a, a derivative meaning legitimately, specifically agreeable to the rules of the lists, or lawfully. For everything to be done correctly in the spiritual realm, you have to strive in the same way that the world strives for reward. He is Lord and you have to be prepared, available and willing. For more information on how to prepare for the ministry callings on your life, I recommend you refer to the book The Manifest the Sons of God by Joseph Hedgecock. In the spiritual realm, everything comes from God. We read in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 5 and 6. This is Revelation, chapter 21. I'm reading verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Verse 6. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end, and I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Jesus is the beginning and the end. The devil tried to take control through humanity, causing others to believe in themselves. The world is self-seeking, full of corruption, contaminated with lies of the devil. But God is not self-seeking, offering the fountain of life so that now you can do everything out of love. John also says in 1 John 4 and verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. You need to be connected to God and keep his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You cannot be faithful without hearing from God. Jesus said in Matthew 6 verse 22 and 23. This is Matthew chapter 6 and verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. Verse 23. But if the eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? The devil tries to get you to trust in what you can see. However, the natural realm is passing away. But what you cannot see with your eyes is eternal you should have no confidence in the flesh whatsoever you can stop use your eyelids and pray instead the more you look the less you see paul said in first corinthians chapter 2 verses 12 to 14 this is first corinthians chapter 2 starting in verse 12 now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of god that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. God will honor all those who do the will of God consistently by relying on the Holy Spirit. 
you will get to rule and reign with Christ. He is even willing to share his inheritance with you as long as you are repenting of what the Holy Spirit is showing you through conviction and changing. Paul said in Hebrews chapter 2 verses 9 to 11. This is Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Verse 11. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus was crowned with glory and honor too, but he had to be made a little lower than the angels, otherwise he could not suffer and die. Angels do not die or suffer. However, those angels God created that followed the devil and deviated from keeping to God's plan will perish. We read in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever. Love is the greatest force on the face of the earth. There is no corruption in God. No one likes this world as much as God. Jesus said in John 3 verses 15 and 16, this is John chapter 3, I'm reading verse 15. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God always does the right thing. God is not weak like the governments of this world who are listening to the devil. We read in Isaiah 14. And verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which does weaken the nations? The church of Ephesus could see the corruption in the early church, but they were blind and could not see how they had lost their first love. Jesus said in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 2 to 5. I'm reading Revelation, chapter 2. Starting in verse 2. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou cannot bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. Verse 3. And hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Verse 4. Nevertheless I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Verse 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. The church of Ephesus had Apostle John as their leader, before being exiled to Patmos. Having a good pastor will not save you, if you have lost your first love, you have deceived yourself that you can develop your love relationship without seeking God for commands personally. For more information about developing your love relationship through his commands, please read the book How Love Grows by Joseph Hedgecock. The Church of Ephesus had not learned how to overcome either. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You overcome sin by having the faith of a child, based on the rightly divided word of truth, not based on strong opinions and the written word, the trials and temptations that you overcome are proof of the grace of God working in your life on the narrow way. James says in James chapter 1 verse 21 to 25. This is James chapter 1. 
I'm reading verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the ingrafted word which is able to save your souls. Verse 22. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Verse 23. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Verse 24. For he beholds himself, and goes his way straightway, and forgets what manner of man he was. Verse 25. But whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty, and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. By grace, you should be able to pray and get an answer from God without any preconceived ideas, man-made doctrines and opinions. Look into the perfect law of liberty with no opinion and ask God. You should believe He is Lord and He can do with you whatever He wants. You need meekness if you want ears to hear the word of truth. But if you allow your own opinions and feelings of others to get in the way, you may not hear the right voice. You can then ask God more questions if something you hear appears to be contrary to what you think or know in the written word, and he will answer. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, I'm reading. This is 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I'm reading verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. Verse 13. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickens all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Using the gift of eternal life, you will hear and know what to say and how to say it. Through the Holy Spirit, you can speak the right words by the grace of God. This is another sign you're on that narrow way. You may not face a Pontius Pilate, but other situations instead, without ever getting in the flesh. In the book, The Guilty Prison, Revised Edition, at the end of chapter 13, on the blessings of freedom, on page 117, Joseph Hedgecock writes, the following is a list of some obvious signs that show you have gone through the straight gate and walk on the narrow way. Number one, you serve God because you love him. John fourteen fifteen. Number two, you enjoy God's peace. Philippians 4 and verse 7. Three, you grow in the Lord. 2 Peter Chapter 3 and verse 18. 4. You enjoy steady spiritual growth as you move from glory to glory in the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. 5. You embrace and appreciate correction. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 5 to 8. 6. All things pass away, and all things become new. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. 7. You become Christ-like as you draw close to him. James chapter 4 and verse 8. Number 8. It becomes easier to stay in God's presence and harder for your flesh and Satan to influence you. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. Number 9. You hear the voice of the Lord. John ten twenty seven. Number 10. You acknowledge the Lord in all your ways. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And number 11. You receive deeper revelation from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10. Someone should have told you that only the narrow way leads to life 
and explain the cost of following Christ. Paul's ministry is described here in Acts chapter 14 and verse 22. This is Acts chapter 14 and verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Many have believed a lie that just repeating some words in a prayer or just accepting Jesus as a Savior is enough. John spoke of corruption in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7. This is 1 John chapter 3, I'm reading verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he's righteous. Jesus died for you. But you will not rule with Christ without true righteousness and the old nature in the grave. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 13 and 14. This is 2 Peter chapter 3 and reading verse 13. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth in which dwelleth righteousness. Verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. You will not be found in Christ if sin is getting you out again and again. If the same sin is always getting you out all the time, then you are not learning. You have access to the Holy Spirit. So now you can turn your weaknesses into strengths. Rely on the Holy Spirit of truth to lead you to the root of sin. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, I'm reading verses 8 to 10. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm starting verse 8. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Verse 9. For we are glad when we are weak and when you are strong. And this is also we wish even your perfection. Verse 10. Therefore I write these things being absent least being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. Paul's words were strong, but he could not say anything contrary to the truth. Those using the witness of the Spirit can confirm everything they hear is the truth, because the Holy Spirit will not bear witness to a lie. If you are getting angry in response to conviction, or you say things you later regret, repent. Great preachers that God used in the past to bring genuine revival were anointed. They did not scare people. They were able to bring the right focus to an individual and the reverential fear of God necessary for salvation and spiritual wisdom. Jesus told us not to fear man. Jesus said in Matthew 10 and verse 26, Fear them not therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. There will be one judgment at the end, and the books will be opened. No one will be cast into the eternal lake of fire before that time. Peter says in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to come to repentance and live a life based on his promises. The lake of fire was designed for those who are independent of him. I believe God is doing everything possible in everyone's life to make sure that only the devil and his angels end up in the lake of fire. When the books are opened, there will be a lot of detail revealed about those who trusted in their own righteousness and they'll be judged at the end. Repentance is a gift now for you to live in the light as he is in the light. There is grace now to change. God is not the problem. Paul said in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 and 2. In Romans chapter 6, I'm reading verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The initial grace was also the means to get more grace and abide in the kingdom of God now. You will see him provide for you on the narrow way. 
People can easily point the finger and blame someone else. However, Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm reading verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you, all towards each other, abounds. Verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Verse 5. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Through those born again on the narrow way God can use to show anyone how to overcome this world by living in the narrow way. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. I'm reading 1 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 16. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Verse 17. For this cause have I sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. The root of sin is still in those making excuses for sin, deceiving themselves so they can fulfill the lust of their flesh. Being Lord of your own life brings sin and shame. You have to completely put your trust in Him. Do not do anything that grieves the Holy Spirit. To be saved, seek to hear God and get on the narrow way. If you want to hear, get to know and follow Jesus, then I can recommend this book, My Sheep, Hear My Voice by Joseph Hedgecock. If you want to make a fresh start and get on the narrow path, sow in the Spirit daily, experience full salvation, and freedom through regular repentance, then I can recommend the book Wake Up, Time is Running Out, Volume 1, Foundations of Spiritual Maturity by Joseph Hedgecock. Do not accept a counterfeit version of Christianity based on religious works so that you do not have to deny yourself daily and trust God. If you know that you have resisted the truth and want to know why, then I can recommend the book The Guilty Prison, Revised Edition by Joseph Hedgecock. Today, this message that I've shared with you is about the narrow way. I hope that you've seen through the scriptures and the message that corruption is everywhere. It's even in the church. And at this time, more than ever, those who are just born again have to make the effort to really enter into the narrow way. Those who are just born again and have just accepted Jesus Christ are most vulnerable. And they must not lean to their understanding. They've got to learn to hear his voice and enter in through the narrow gate. Jesus told us many times, but the church has ignored these warnings. But now, more than ever, in these last days, this is such an important message. And I'm praying for you right now. If you're listening to this message, do not trust in your reasoning. Do not have a confidence in the flesh whatsoever. But trust in what God is doing and what God can do through you and to you on the narrow way because he knows exactly what you need to deal with now and through that narrow way you will grow up so fast compared to anyone else trying to do things with the natural mind i encourage you to get on that narrow way and finish the race and the work that God starts to do in your life. If you've got stuck, if you've come off the narrow way, there's no harm. 
repent, get back in and start back on that narrow way. As soon as you come off, get back in. That minimizes the damage and start back on that narrow way. Let me pray with you right now. Father in heaven, I'm believing there are people listening to this message and you have moved in their hearts through this message and that they are ready to get on that narrow way. Father, I pray that they will draw near unto you. They will experience that the kingdom of God now so that they know that peace and joy that consolation of the Spirit that they need daily to stay on that narrow way. Heavenly Father, I am praying for them not to depart from you, not to depart from the living God and not to seek things in this world at all, that they might be ready for your appearing. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. I'm so glad you listened to this message. I pray that it changes you forever. You can find a summary of all the scriptures used in today's message below the video, either written out or via link to a website. Our contact details will follow at the end of this message. Please get in touch if you need more help. But Jesus is coming soon. God bless you.